So, Heather, uh, this week you, you had a piece uh, on Salon as opposed to your blog, Hullabaloo, which is a daily read for me, as you know. Um, you had a piece on Salon uh, about Donald Trump's casino empire and the potential and possible links to money laundering. You write that past financial crimes may be the president's biggest problem. And, and frankly, <clears throat> for me, I don't know about some of his associates. I think it's quite possible there's some ongoing and who knows what their relationships with um, the Russian government is. But a couple of things that always resonate for me is when Paul Manafort said, like, I never knowingly uh, dealt with any Russian, um, uh, you know, agents or whatnot. And, you know, Donald Trump, one of his closest associates, in fact, was a was a named and titled advisor, special advisor to him for about three or four years, was a guy named uh, Felix Sater, who is a known Russian mafia figure. Um, he has also been known to have been an informant and an asset for uh, the FBI. Uh, we have even, um, uh, you know, we have uh, the FBI on record uh, and the uh, former um, attorney general under uh, under Obama on record is saying this guy has been a valuable asset. Um, I suspect that the Venn diagram between Russian, I guess, spying assets and Russian mafia is pretty big. <laughs> the overlap <laughs> there is, I would imagine, is pretty big. And um, I've always been convinced that to the extent that there's any relationships there, uh, Donald Trump is just assuming these guys are all just ma Russian mafia guys. Uh, <laughs> or uh, And it turns out, well, they also, you know, they... They they work on 1099s and they work for a lot of different people. Um, but tell us about your story here. Well, I think uh, what what made me think of it was is that in, in one of the Washington Post articles from last week, it was revealed that the FBI investigation is not just into Russian collusion into uh, you know in the in the uh, collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russian government in the in the uh, presidential campaign. But there was just one throwaway line. It is also into financial crimes involving Russia. And I went, ooh. Um, that, now it may be, I don't know when Trump was informed of this. I assume that somewhere along the line he knew, was informed that financial crimes were, had, were part of the mandate for this Russian investigation, and specifically under Robert Mueller. But it does sort of indicate why he might have been so panicked, in my view. Uh, about this investigation in ways that, that make a little bit more sense to me than the idea that he's, you know, Putin's puppet or is being blackmailed. Right. I'm not saying that's impossible. Uh, anything is possible with this guy, and there's plenty of reason to think that there was all kinds of shenanigans going on there. But when you look at what it really motivates Donald Trump and what really seems to, to have him mostly protective and concerned about it's his business, right? I mean, he's been completely untransparent, refused to divest, no tax returns, all the way along the line, absolutely adamant that he was not going to reveal any of that. Well, when you look at these financial, you know, when you realize that the FBI it now has a mandate to look at the financial crimes and that the Senate um, Intelligence Committee uh, requested documents from what's called the FinCEN, which is part of the Treasury Department. It's an investigative unit that tracks financial um, transactions. And it turns out that Trump, going all the way back to the 1990s, has been tracked by the U.S. government. It has been, he, his, the Trump Organization has been fined numerous times, 106 times in the first year and a half of the Trump Taj Mahal, for mm. money laundering. Money laundering. And during this period, Trump, half the people at the Trump Taj Mahal who were money laundering were Russian mobsters. I mean, this is all on the record. It's, it's been out there. And, and, you know, various news organizations have started to dig into this. As recently as 2009, the Trump Taj Mahal was fined for uh, infractions to do with money laundering. This was during the period it was in bankruptcy. I mean, you know, the Trump Taj Mahal, I don't think people realize, just closed in October of 2016. It shut right. its doors. 
Now, Trump has not been involved in any direct level for some time, but he was involved in the 2000s. He was doing all kinds of, of you know, refinancing and in very kind of shady ways. And he has been involved in the two main uh, areas uh, of, of money laundering that are used by criminals, Russians and others, real estate and casinos. These are the right. two places where these people park their money because it's it's you know it's less it's it's harder to trace. Um, in any case, I think this is really an important story, and clearly the Senate Intelligence Committee thinks so. Clearly, the FBI thinks so, and it's I suspect that this is where Donald Trump is feeling this kind of you know sense of overwhelming panic welling up in him because this is where he's truly vulnerable. And, you know, I don't know where that leads us in terms of his presidency and how that plays into it, but, you know, one can assume that if a special prosecutor thought that a land deal that lost $20,000 uh, to a president was worthy of eight years of <laughs> harassment, that this is the sort of thing that would keep Donald Trump up at night. Um, it's pretty well, clear that he's vulnerable. Yeah, I mean, it's and it's interesting because, you know, uh, Robert Mueller does not have the authority that Ken Starr has. Uh, does not have the... I mean, he's been granted it, but he's had to be granted it, you know, for specific mm -hmm. things. Uh, whereas uh, Ken Starr, because of had a statutory authority to do anything, essentially, uh, and investigate anything. That's how uh, you go from uh, the the the, um, uh, the Whitewater land deal and um, move ahead 40 years in time or 30 years in time to get the president uh, impeached because he uh, fibbed or lied in a deposition about just how, mu how, how intimate he was sexually uh, with somebody he was having an affair with. Um, and, I mean, that's how you get that far. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, uh, Mueller could get to that point, too. It's just that at one point somebody could stop him in a way that Ken Starr could not be stopped. Uh, but it's going to be interesting because I also think, I mean, look, uh, Jared Kushner, uh, some of the people that apparently he has met with were, you know, Russian yep. banks that were uh, supposedly um, uh, uh, embargoed. And so uh, there's there's certainly something going on here. And 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 you're right about the uh, money laundering with uh, real estate. I mean, it's obvious uh, how that happens in the context of casinos. But, you know, New York City now is. Uh, you see a lot of different people coming in with twenty, thirty million dollars in cash. Maybe they overpay for a uh, for an apartment. That's called the you know the service charge essentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, then all of a sudden they turn around and sell it a couple of years later. Uh, maybe they make some of their money back too, uh, because uh, but they they've got now clean money. So uh, definitely, I think. We're going to see um, uh, some of that in the future. But let's take a break. And uh, since we're talking about Trump and talking about money, let's talk about the Trump budget, which was released this week. And also, um, uh, we should just touch on, you know, the we saw a CBO score didn't uh, work out so well for the uh, repeal and replace of Obamacare. But let's talk about that budget, because um, uh, this is this is really what people consider to be an expression of the values of uh, the the entity that puts out the budget. And certainly um, it sounds like Trump. We got to take a quick break. Be right back with Digby, Ring of Fire Radio. <laughs> 